Although the M1 rifle is recognized as being an achievement of industrial design and American ingenuity, it didn't just happen. It took engineering prowess, versatility, and lots of hard work to reach the final version of the rifle that was mass produced before, during, and after the Second World War. Revisions to subcomponents occurred during both design development and production. First of all, the rifle had to transition from 276 caliber to 30 caliber. Then it had to transition from being a rifle handmade to a rifle that could be mass produced using modern industrial manufacturing techniques. Eventually, of course, it had to transition from a gas trap to a gas port operating system. Those problems are well known, but there were countless other less familiar bumps in the road that had to be overcome by sheer engineering skill. And that's why I've come to the CMP Marksmanship Park today. I've come here to learn a little bit more about one of those bumps in the road, the so-called seventh round stoppage. In August 1939, Springfield Armory began to observe M1 rifles malfunctioning. And what they found specifically was that when you loaded an M-block clip where the top round was on the right, you would get, sometimes, a failure to feed on the seventh round. This occurred at a time when Springfield was attempting to expand M1 production sharply from 200 rifles per month to 100,000 rifles per month. So the timing couldn't have been worse. What technicians at Springfield found was that at the moment when the seventh round was about to be introduced into the chamber, it was slightly unsupported by the follower. There was a little bit of sloppy wobble. And that was being caused by the fact that the forward guide rib on the left side of the receiver had been nipped off. They had not even noticed this before until the problem manifested itself. But during production, when the receiver was cut out of solid metal, the tool that performed the cut of the hole where the barrel would ultimately thread in, that tool was being allowed to over-travel. And because of this over-traveling depth of cut, the tool was snipping off the very top of the left-hand forward guide rib. And what that meant was that right as the follower reached the top of travel, it wasn't fully supported. The problem didn't really present itself if the top round of the clip was loaded on the left side but only presented itself when the top round was loaded on the right side. And it only presented itself every now and then. It was a very uncommon malfunction, but it was still a malfunction, and that wasn't good enough for Springfield. Every single rifle had to pass function fire. And in order to get these rifles through function fire, something had to be done about the seventh round stoppage. Okay, Chris, you know we had 21935 out at the range, and we were able to get it to malfunction on the seventh round. We wanted to talk to you to tell us why is that happening and what was done to correct that problem. Okay, so originally the main problem that they found on these early receivers is that in initial inspection, sometimes these rifles would pass the function checks they would need because they would go just far enough to where it would barely knock that rib off. And that's what I would lean toward to cause this problem. But there are other things we can inspect that may also cause this problem. So we can go ahead and start tearing this rifle open. So I'm gonna reference our shop guide here. And under cartridge misfeed or fail to feed, you've got a number of things that could cause this. The first thing we're gonna look at is operating rod spring is weak, deformed, damaged, or it's the wrong spring. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at the length of the spring at rest. So maximum length on an M1 Garand operating spring is 20 inches and one quarter. This spring measures out at 18 inches and three quarters, so it is a bit shorter than what we would typically see on a standard spring, but there is a little give there. The book doesn't actually specify a too short, but typically what you find when you have a weak spring is it will give you problems far sooner than just that seventh round stoppage. Moving on from there, we can look at operating rod drags or binds. The way we're gonna check that, we'll do what we call a tilt test. So we're just gonna tilt this rifle looking for free movement of the opera. So it's gonna be fine. Right, so there's no binding issues or anything there. So we can eliminate that problem altogether. Going back down here, we're going to look at the follower arm being twisted, bent, or broken. Go ahead and remove these internal workings from the rifle. So here's our follower arm. You wanna look, make sure there's no bends. You can actually take part of a machinist square and hold it against 
this edge here to make sure that everything is straight and flat as it should be. If you have any deviations from this, it's bent down or anything, this can not only cause that seventh round stoppage or any misfeed, it can cause timing issues where it may get a misfeed on the first round, the fifth round, the third round. That's a major component there is a bent follower arm. Well, this one looks fine. This one's fine, yes sir. This one gauges out straight, flat, everything's good to go there. So we'll move on to the bullet guide is deformed or damaged. So here's our bullet guide. And what we're looking for here is any twist, bends, or anything. This is more of a visual check. You would be able to visually see that there was something wrong here. This one is good to go. There's no unnecessary rubbing between any parts, so we know there's no binding issues there. There would be finish removed, hard scratches and bind marks here on these if there was a problem, but I don't see any visually, so we're gonna go ahead and say this one's good to go. The big thing here, the big culprit we can see sometimes is your follower assembly, your whole slide assembly. So this is what pushes the rounds up through the clip as the rifle functions. What we're looking for here mainly is to make sure that this area here is flat. There's no bends or twists or anything there. That can cause uneven angles as the follower pushes around to the top. The way we check that is we take, again, our machinist edge here and we hold it against the flat here and we can see that there's no deviations there. It's flat. Now, you can take this slide off of here and do a little bit of further inspection on that, look at other parts, but removing these slides can be problematic because they weren't made to be removed once they were assembled. So if you try to remove this, it's a very good possibility you'll break that, and at that point you'll have to replace the whole follower slide assembly. So we're gonna leave that in place right now. We're not gonna take that off. This rifle's too valuable. Yeah, there's, there's too many valuable parts, too many early parts in original finish for me to risk. It. You'll notice here that this isn't a straight 90 degree angle from the flat on the follower itself. These pads where it runs inside the pathways on the receiver, which is there for a reason. These are actually set to be a 92 degree turn, plus or minus, about two tenths of a degree. So like front up for the bullet to have a little bit of a favor right. toward the chamber. Huh? Right, yes sir. So everything I can tell on this rifle under inspection here is, in my opinion, is that this spot here in the receiver is what causes your seventh round stoppage. Now other things to consider there as well, some of the last points we'll look at on this is that lack of lubrication on the operating parts can also cause this. I can tell by my hands that there's plenty of lubrication on this rifle. So I don't think that that's gonna be your problem either. It also says here to see uh, the section on short cycling. We can turn to that. But a lot of these are just going over the same thing, looking for binds, looking for, for any of these parts that may bind together, causing the system to not operate as it, as it should. The main things we're gonna check when we do a gas system check, since we've already checked all these other parts, is we're going to check the gas cylinder itself, the gas port on the barrel, and then the operating piston on the end of the operating arm. Those are the main parts that control the flow of gas through the rifle. If any of these are oversized or undersized, it's gonna give you problems in your cycling. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the op rod since it's already out. I'm gonna take a set of micrometers and we're gonna measure this piston. Now typically a minimum on these, we look for around 525 thousandths on our measurement for the piston. And you wanna measure it at different angles. Because of the way this runs, you could think of it running uh, like the wheels on an old steam locomotive. That arm kind of goes up and down as it runs. Same thing with that operating rod. Under, under fire and under operation, it kind of bounces through the gas cylinder, so it's gonna wear at different rates. So we wanna measure all the way around to get a good measurement. Starting here, we're measuring at just over 524,000. So we're actually almost a thousand under what we would find there. So that's a little undersized to that. So you could lose some gas in the system through that. Absolutely. Both of those read around 524,000 is just over. But depending on the combination of parts that you have here, you may also find that even with a little bit of undersized there on the gas piston on the operating rod, you may still have enough gas in the system for it to operate. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to removing this gas cylinder off the rifle. So we have a gas cylinder gauge here. This is actually checking an expansion chamber inside the gas cylinder. As this drops, it's gonna be measuring here with this portion of this gauge itself, and it's measuring that pinnacle point inside the gas cylinder that actually captures the gas. Once it passes that point in the gas cylinder, it's just inertia and built up energy that blows the operating rod all the way to the rear. It's just this one portion here. If this one portion of the gas cylinder wears past the point of where this gauge can measure, it doesn't matter how the rest of the uh, gas cylinder looks. Enough gas is allowed to escape in that instance of where it's fired that it's gonna pass enough to where it's not So if that's not in spec, it doesn't matter. It right, doesn't, doesn't matter The quality of the rest of the gas cylinder is irrelevant. Right, so what we're looking at here is this says must protrude. What we're looking for is the top layer of this, just the top corner of that, to protrude slightly out of the mouth of this gas cylinder as we drop it in from the threads. So we're gonna drop that in there. And as you can see, there's actually a pretty good bit of that 
coming out. Now, most of the time when people pick up one of these gauges, they're expecting it to gauge like this. You know, they're, that's, they're expecting. That's, that's very unlikely. Even brand new gas cylinders, we found that were wrapped in Cosmoline, that's about as good as they get. You're looking for a little bit of protrusion or flush. Once they get about flush, that's where we start seeing problems to where if you do have a, a piston that's undersized, it's where you start getting enough blow by to where it'll cause what we call a short cycle. With this gas cylinder though, with the way that it gauges, it's got that protrusion there. I feel confident that this gas cylinder is in good enough condition that even with that half a thousand off of that minimum measurement we're looking for on the op rod, that it's still going to function out. And I believe it functioned correctly for you guys, other than that seventh round stop. Other than the seventh round, it ran fine. So I'm going to assume that that part of it isn't going to be a problem, but we'll continue to investigate as we've got it apart. So we'll flip this over now. The next thing we're going to check is the gas port on this M1 Grand. Now, modern production barrels such as Criterion and Krieger that we deal with primarily here in our shop, they measure typically out of the factory around 78,000. That's about close to minimum there. Maximum on an M1 Garand gas port is around 82,000. Anything bigger than that, you're going to get too much gas in the system. And too much gas in the, in the gas system of an M1 Garand can actually be detrimental to the, so not only the function of the rifle, but to the life of the rifle. It can actually damage the rifle, damage the operating rod, and even the receiver if too much gas is in the system. So just to make sure that this rifle is not overgassed, we're going to go ahead and check that gas port on there. So we're going to take our precision pin gauge here. I'm going to start off with 78 thousandths, which is typically what we find on these. And it slides in there pretty easy. So we're going to try to move up one to 79 thousandths. And it slides in there as well, a little snug. So I'm guessing that's probably going to be the end of that. Okay, so 80 thousandths won't fit. So the gas port on this one is somewhere around 79 thousandths, which is well within our window of what we want to see. Heck, yeah. it's, it's not right at minimum, but it's not close to maximum either. It's about right there in the middle. So. The gas system, from what I can tell, other than that half a thousandth of wear on that uh, operating rod, is going to be good to go. And again, like we mentioned, the age of these parts and this rifle being as close to correct as it is, that's honestly very good readings for one of these rifles in this yeah. age, yeah. in this condition. So from what I can tell, I don't see any reason more short cycle would cause this problem. I'm going to go back to, to the original idea that, just like we thought, that cutaway where they did that original drilling for that hole is what caused that seventh round stoppage on this rifle. Do you think if you went with a longer spring, it would resolve the problem? I don't believe so, no, no. sir. I think that spring is well within serviceable specifications of what we would see on a Garand. Any shorter than that, I would probably go for that. And I would be more worried if this was a cut spring. But as you can see on this spring on both ends, it ends in a closed coil. So that means they that- They made it that way. They yeah. made it that yeah. way. Even though it's fully an inch shorter than it's supposed to be. I think that if it was a problem and the length of that spring was going to be a problem, it would cause a lot more than just a seventh round stoppage. You would, would start seeing, seeing other problems. You would start seeing a lot of other problems in that cycle of operations. In my opinion, I don't believe the change in that spring would have any bearing at all. Even if you put a new production, modern day spring in there, like, much like we put in our CMP specials, I still don't think that would have any bearing on changing that seventh round stoppage when feeding from the ride. So this is fascinating. So you're going all the way right back to where the problem began, the ribs. That's right. Yes, sir. In April 2017, a CMP employee by the name of Floyd Snyder was unpacking a crate of 100 ceremonial drill rifles when he reached in and pulled out this. Springfield Armory serial number 35093, a 100% as-built gas trap M1 rifle. Now, it's exciting enough to find an as-built gas trap because you just don't see those much anymore. But there's something else that makes 35093 special, and that is that the rifle has some electro penciling on major components like the operating rod and the gas cylinder. With additional research, it was discovered that that electro penciling was placed on 35093 because this rifle was involved in solving the problem of the seventh round stoppage. We know this because of Walter Campbell. He was an employee at the Springfield Armory that kept meticulous notes throughout his time there. And he documented how, in early 1940, two rifles, 35091 and then this 35093, were modified to overcome the seventh round stoppage problem. And the way that they modified the two rifles was by welding up or building up a little bit of metal on the top of the sheared off guide rib on the left side and the front. After this modification was introduced, 35091 and this rifle were then sent to Frankfurt Arsenal in Philadelphia, 
where they were both tested. 35093 was tested on March 19, 1940 by firing 1,000 rounds of various types of 30 caliber ammunition. And the rifle fired that 1,000 rounds without so much as a hiccup. So this tiny little modification solved the problem of the seventh round stoppage. What Springfield did from that point forward was recall the rifles that had already been produced with the sheared off guide rib, and then they introduced that little modification that eliminated the problem. Then for further production, they simply changed the depth of cut of the tool that cut the hole that the barrel would ultimately thread into. And they changed it so that it no longer over-traveled to shear off the guide rib. So, problem solved. In a way, the rifle this man designed for us was perfect. That was certainly the case early in M1 Garand production. But then 80 years ago, when they had to expand production of the rifle from 200 units a month to 100,000 units a month, there was a bump in the road, and it was called the seventh round stoppage. For me, the big takeaway of this story is that when that bump in the road presented itself, there were smart people on hand who could identify the source of the problem and then fix it once and for all, making it possible for the M1 to then go overseas and fight the Second World War and establish its stellar reputation for reliability under the adverse conditions of combat. And there you have it, another fascinating chapter in the history of this rifle that we are all so enthusiastic about collecting and shooting. On behalf of the Grand Collectors Association, I'm Marty Morgan, thank you for watching. The Garand Collectors Association was created to exchange information and expand knowledge of the U.S. rifle Caliber 30 M1. To preserve and publicize history of the rifle and its inventor, John C. Garand. To assist and encourage new collectors. To assist authors in writing new reference works. To assist members in their collecting and to encourage competitive and recreational safe shooting of the rifle. GCA membership is inexpensive and brings useful benefits. Members receive the GCA Journal, a publication that presents invaluable technical and historical information about the M1 rifle. Membership also qualifies you to make purchases through the Civilian Marksmanship Program. To apply, simply visit thegca.org where you can find a membership application form. You can even join online. It's well worth the low cost to join a community of people who collect and shoot the greatest battle implement ever devised.